This is the Nebraska Broadcasters Association History Project. It's a look at the people and the personalities who have made Nebraska radio and television what it is today. We're recording today at WOWT Channel 6 in Omaha, and our thanks to Jeff Sabin for his help. For the NBA, I'm Neil Nelkin. Sometimes our people have an outsized influence on broadcasting in Nebraska, even when they've not been employed by a radio television station specifically. They don't work day to day at a station, but they do have a significant influence because they work with the advertisers who are the engine of what we do in radio and television with advertising dollars. Our guest today is just one of those people who have has a history of working with just about everybody and every media in the Omaha market for quite some time. He's been instrumental in bringing along a lot of the people who are in the market today working in advertising. And I can safely say that she has trained a lot of the people to do things the right way, her way. As a woman, she has been a groundbreaker, a leader, not only in her own career, but as an active member of American Women and Radio and Television here in Omaha, as well as other organizations. She's been an associate member of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association for some time as well. We welcome to the NBA History Project, Claudia Martin. Claudia, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure. You've been around some time and have seen most everyone come along that has gone through this market, but let's go back to the very beginning. Okay. Farm girl from the rural area comes to the big city. Washington County, Nebraska. Yes, farm girl. And you come to the big city of Omaha. Yes. Why? A paycheck. Uh. <laughs> and how did you get started in this crazy business? My first job in the broadcasting industry was at KMTV. My first job was typing logs on the Ditto Master on a manual typewriter, which was a real clunker. It stood on a little base. And the first couple of months that I was there, we still checked a box that said black and white or color. It made a difference back then. It did make a big difference back then. I've got a couple of those old logs. I saved them. Black and white or color. Uh -huh. And commercials back then were almost always on film. Correct. There was not a lot of videotape being used. And we started out with two-inch tape when we did. Quadruplex. <laughs> two-inch quadruplex, reel-to-reel -reel videotape. Those were great days. Yes. And Channel 3 was pretty much a pioneer in a lot of areas back then in terms of videotape and color. And they were the NBC affiliate when I worked there, too. The Tom Brokaw days. Although I'm, I crossed paths with Tom Brokaw for something like 18 days. People don't realize he was a local news anchor uh -huh. here in Omaha before he hit the big time. Yes. And uh, from uh, North Dakota, I believe. I think you're right. Yeah. Sioux, no, he was from Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls. At least Close. he worked in Sioux Falls anyway. Now tell me about you uh, experienced here at KMTV. Who were some of the people that were here then? Can you give me an idea? Well, I think I shared with you how I got hired there. The station manager was a gentleman named Arden Swisher. <clears throat> who went on to become a vice president of Mutual of Omaha after he left the station. But um, he's what I called a rocker and a poser, meaning he would talk to me like this, I'm rocking, I'm posing, I'm talking, I'm rocking, I'm posing. He never sat still. <laughs> and the job that I was applying for was to be a sales assistant to the sales staff. And in those days, the sales staff were all men, no women allowed. And they could be a rather... Uh, we'll call it blue group, a little rough around the edges. Raucous? They, well, they would drink at lunch and write out orders on napkins and would stuff their shirts in their pants in front of me. Didn't even think anything about it. And so when I am interviewing for the job, Mr. Swisher said, you know what I need? I need the kind of young woman, young gal, who can smile and say go to hell at the same time. And who knows where this came from. I don't know how it fell out of my head. But I looked at him, I smiled, and then my sweetest little voice said, go to hell. And he laughed and said, you're hired. Can you start on Monday? About two years here at KMTV, right? I worked, uh, I think, six years at KMTV, grand total. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what made you decide to leave? I got recruited by an agency called J. Lipsy & Associates. Their big client was Brandeis. 
and Brandeis was expanding, and they decided to have this new fangled employee called a media buyer. And so I got recruited to be that person. How closely did you work with the management at Brandeis? Uh, not a lot. Okay. But you did place their media But buys. I placed all their media. What did you know about placing media? We learned a lot. What I did know was ratings, because at KMTV, ratings were everything. So if you could read a ratings book, that was the big start. And at the time, there were, what, three television stations and maybe six radio stations? We called it two and a half stations then, because KETV wasn't even on the air full time yet. They went on the air something like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then, like you said, about six radio stations. And two of them, KFAB and WWAM, probably accounted for well over 60% of the audience anyway. And, of course, the major newspaper in the market. Yes. So you placed all the newspaper advertising as well? Not for the Brandeis. They had their own internal department to do that. But you learned how to but do I that. I learned from them, that's for sure. Yes. So after Lipsy and Associates, uh, you moved on. I moved on. And my next job after that was at KFOR. In Lincoln. In Lincoln. I was recruited by Roger Larson to be the first woman to ever sell media in Lancaster County. That the was first woman. The first woman to sell media in Lancaster County. Now with an all-male sales staff there. With an uh, all-male everything. In? They took very good care of me, actually. Um, Roger wouldn't accept anything less, I'm sure. Things like one of the salespeople, Gay Cole, if I had a client that was in a part of Lincoln that he didn't think was the most nice part of town, he would demand that I, that I ride with him, that he would take me and introduce me and bring me back. He said, you, if your father would do this for you, I will do this too. These were the legendary days of KFOR. The You're Vince talking Gabe, people like Vince, Vince Calora, Gabe, Paul Abels, Red Gabe, Abels. Red Abels, Gay Cole. Uh -huh. And I worked for Roger Larson. What a place to learn. What a place to learn. And I was the add-on salesperson. I sold for the AM, and I was down the hall where the FM was. So I know that Roger Larson, when he had his sales meetings, I don't remember what day and time they were, but when it was time for the sales meetings, he would ask his secretary to go down the hall and get the kids. And that was me. I was one of the kids. And what was your most valuable experience learning from the people at KFOR? Empathy. That, I, that, that the salespeople had the hardest job in the building. Not sympathy. Not sympathy. It was empathy. Empathy. How does that apply to radio sales? <laughs> Because then later on, the lesson I learned, I didn't know I was learning it until later. When I started working with more radio and TV salespeople, I knew and understood what their job was and how hard it was that people lie to you. People make appointments and don't show up. Uh, people make appointments and keep you waiting for 45 minutes. And then don't buy. And then don't buy. <laughs> and then don't pay if they do. <laughs> you learned quickly, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> you learned a lot. One of the, the high points of working for Roger Larson has got to be learning his management style, which was unique at the time. Roger uh, really knew how to make people deliver at their best. I think he probably learned that from Dick Chapin. Probably. Well, we had Saturday morning sales meetings at 7 a.m., and you better not be late. I remember those days. <laughs> Today, if you were to ask your team to show up at 7 a.m. Saturday, they probably would leave. And if you did, the women would probably show up with wet hair. <laughs> but there were no women. Everybody but there drank. there were no women. Everybody That's drank hard, smoked everywhere. Smoked in the office. Yeah. Yes. It was a whole different time. Mm -hmm. But it was different. fun. I learned a lot. And then after KFOR, you decided to come back to Omaha? I got recruited back to Jay Lipsy & Associates because the owner, Jim Lipsy, was retiring, moving to Arizona, and his son, Bob, was taking over the agency and wanted me back. So it came at a time where I was just at the point where I'd had enough homesick, missing my parents. It was right after the holidays, so I came back. The good news is, not only did I spend those months learning a lot, but when I came back to Jay Lipsy, they had to pay me a whole lot more money to get me back. So it was like a big bump, big raise. That was appreciated. That was very much appreciated. Well, you came back on the other side. Now, instead of being the, uh, the media seller, you come back as a media buyer. And an advertising Much agency. Much more like my style, yes. yes. Who were your big accounts then? Uh, when I was at J. Lipsy & Associates, my biggest account was Brandeis. 
and I helped open up the Council Bluffs store. And what I remember about that was that the copy read it was the first escalator in Council Bluffs. That was big news. <laughs> and Des Moines helped open the Des Moines store, and I got to meet Oscar de la Renta. So that was the highlight of that one. And then, uh, as all good things do, Brandeis came to pass. You moved on. I moved on. So when I left J. Lipsy & Associates, I got recruited to this agency called Winslow Advertising because they had Sears and McDonald's and were looking for a buyer because they had a clients that their national agencies required the local agencies to have certain criteria and tools. So that was why I got hired there. Another learning experience? Another learning experience. Harold Winslow, is he still alive, by the way? I don't know. I don't know either, but nobody drank bigger or harder than Harold Winslow. Uh, he was the kind of boss that you had conversations with him in the morning because when he came back from lunch, it was not going to be worth your time. You worked with all of them. Oh, my gosh, yes. And they knew you and you knew them and all their <laughs> idiosyncrasies. Uh, the big one that came after that, of course, was Fredrickson. I went to work for Fredrickson Hohenschel. Fredrickson Hohenschel was owned by Keith Fredrickson and Russ Hohenschel. And I was recruited there because they had just landed the Nebraska Furniture Mart account within the previous year. Previous to Fredrickson Hohenschel, their agency was Gene Sullivan. Gene Sullivan had been Mrs. B's closest compa compatriot, I suppose would be the word, for maybe 25, 30 years. And Jean was ill. She knew that she was on her last year or two. She had cancer. And so she handpicked Fredrickson Hohenschel as the agency that she wanted to work with Nebraska Furniture Mart because she considered them ethical and kind of old school, actually. And she almost demanded that they hire me because from my KMTV days working with her, she just liked me. I'm the one of the few people that didn't accuse her of being a male on the phone because she had a very deep, low bass voice. But we got along fine, so that's how I got to work with Nebraska Furniture Mart. You also learned early about relationships and how important those are. That is very true. And it's always interesting that those things you learn, you don't know you're learning them while you're learning them. You learn them later on when you realize and look back and see what happened. Now, did Jean stay active with uh, you at the agency managing for, the press? For, for probably the first year or two. She kind of de-escalated over the next couple of years. But downloaded everything you needed to know. But downloaded everything I needed to know. She left me with a lot of photographs and letters that Mrs. B wrote. I've got quite an archive of history of Mrs. B, by the way. You knew Mrs. B quite well. I was scared to death of Mrs. B. I stayed out of her way. One of my favorite Mrs. B stories is when the uh, press conference was going to be held when Mrs. B was selling 80% of Nebraska Furniture Mart to Berkshire Hathaway to Warren Buffett. So there was, as you might imagine, going to be a wonderful little press event at the store. And I was in charge of setting it up <clears throat> with the press. So I had cookies and napkins and coffee and water and everything all set up. And then when it's time for the press conference, up comes Mrs. B with her golf cart. And she looks at this stuff and says, what is this stuff? What is this? And I said, well, this is coffee and cookies for the press when they get here. And she said, no, get rid of it all. Get rid of it all. And I am now aghast because this has been my only job is to set up cookies and coffee for the press. And she said, get it out of here. I want no crumbs on my carpets. Be gone, be gone. So I took it down to the employee lunchroom and they got to have the cookies. <laughs> what about, you were relating a little bit, and I know you, know you were there at the time, that the rift between Mrs. B and the Blumkin brothers yeah. uh, separated Mrs. B's furniture outlet. It was old school versus new school and Mrs. B, one of the things she liked to do was manage the carpet department. So she would have rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls of carpet and everything in the carpet department was rolls. Well, after a while, excuse me, but the mice started living in the rolls of carpet and the boys wanted to renovate the carpet department so it was what was called waterfalls so that you could just flip it up over a rack. So one weekend, or I don't know, maybe it was a high Jewish holiday, I don't know which because Mrs. B worked almost every day. When she came to the store, her rolls had been moved out and the waterfall said come in. And that's one of the issues. There was a couple, but that was one of the big ones that got her to walk out, storm out. So she walked across the street. There was an old paint factory next door and she bought the building and opened up Mrs. B's clearance center to go into competition with her son's 
with their grandsons. That only lasted a few years. That lasted a few years, and they made up. And she lived to be 104. She lived a long, long time. Yeah. Yes, she did. But when she was there, she interacted with customers individually. Every day. All the Blumpkins do. They're, they're in that store, probably. Even the grandsons or the great-grandsons, at least six days a week. But Mrs. B was there every day unless it was a high Jewish holiday. And if it was a high holiday when she wasn't allowed to work, she would have her driver drive her around to the competition and look in their windows to see who was shopping not at her store. <laughs> you worked very closely with the Blumkins and learned a lot from them and also interacted mm -hmm. very much with their way of doing business, yes. which of course is an unparalleled success. But from the media perspective, how did Nebraska Furniture Mart, which was arguably the largest advertiser in the market, uh, how did you deal with the media? Uh, the, the iconic slogan was, tell the truth. Always tell the truth. So we did. Sell cheap and tell the truth. Sell cheap and tell the truth. Only I was supposed to buy cheap and tell the truth. <laughs> you also were instrumental in what is a legendary process, the co-op advertising policies uh, uh -huh. of Nebraska Furniture Mart, which uh -huh. is now NFM. But uh, uh, the fact that they were the largest advertiser, but didn't spend a lot of their own money. That is true. How'd that work? How'd that work? Well, Nebraska Furniture Mart would have annual meetings with all of their vendors, and if you wanted to sell your merchandise in their store, you came up with vendor fund and vendor funding, vendor co-op dollars. So my job for many of those years was the implementation of those co-op dollars to make sure that if I was spending a $4,000 schedule, that 2,000 of it was paid by Broyhill and 2,000 of it was paid by Pennsylvania House, and I made sure that those dollars were allocated and billed and notarized affidavits and all the paperwork that went with it so they could collect the money. This was the days before computerization. Yes. How do you keep track of it all? That's called a calculator and a pencil and a tablet, and that's what you did. Did you have a staff? Um, I had an assistant in the early days, and things grew exponentially later, but when I first started working with Nebraska Furniture Mart, it was one store. I remember when we opened up the electronics department and sold TVs for the first time. Mm -hmm. But as we added more stores and added more markets and things got bigger, more departments, the Mega Mart was big, then yes, we started adding more staff. And computers. And more computers and more software. And it all worked to the benefit of, uh -huh. of the market because you're able to spend more on advertising. That is true. What about the relationship between the, the Nebraska Furniture Mart and broadcasters as the broadcasters being uh, the medium you used, radio and television, to reach your potential customers. You've obviously seen a lot of radio and television salespeople over the years. True. What was your relationship with them? With the salespeople? Uh, I, I hope it's as good as I think it was. <laughs> 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 and a lot of the people that I worked with ended up being longtime friends for 10, 15, or 20, more, 20 or more years, so I think that speaks well. But again, telling the truth, having relationships, having conversations, uh, being open about what goals and strategies were. It wasn't always about ratings, was it? It wasn't always about ratings. It was about being appropriate. In the world of Nebraska Furniture Mart, we tried to stay away from anything that was too violent. It had to be family friendly. Disney friendly was the, the goal. It had to be not controversial. We stayed away from political advertising programs. In other words, we would never have a spot inside a debate, for example. And again, no violence and no religion. That was some of their rules. Stay away non from those. Non-controversial. Non-controversial. If it's Disney friendly, then it's okay. How do you deal with people that you developed close relationships with and then didn't make the buy? Well, if you had a good relationship with them, they understood why. If you told them the truth why, it was never about the person. It was always about the product. You never attack a person. You don't attack anyway, but you explain why the product isn't appropriate and what they need to do to make that product work for us. Did you ever run into uh, conflicts? You were known, of course, for enforcing honesty, ethics, always. Always. Did you ever run into some people who didn't necessarily believe in that? Of course. And how do you deal with that? <laughs> you try not to work with them. Um, I've had more than one conversation with a sales manager about a salesperson being not quite ethical in my 
point of view and could we either train that person to work in a more ethical way or could we find someone else who would more fit my, my patterns? What was the biggest lesson you learned all those years working at the Furniture Mart, working for the Furniture Mart and for the Blumkins? Well, again, it's sell cheap and tell the truth. It was always about ethics. It was always about being appropriate. One of, their, one of the things that Irv always taught us was take the heat. In other words, if somebody has a problem, H stood for hear them out, E stood for empathize, A was for action, and T was for, no, A was for what? Apologize, and T was for take the action. So anytime there was a problem, you went through the process, H-E-A-T, and that's how you solve problems. Unusual. Hear them out, empathize, apologize, and then take action. For a big company to take that much effort to be fair and mm -hmm. honest, that's unusual. That's why I like working with them. And you worked with them for how many years? 35 years. Nebraska Furniture Mart. Yes. You've seen some great salespeople come along in those 35 years. Uh -huh. And a number of them you still have important relationships with. But empathy, personal relationships, have we lost a lot of that over we the years? We have lost so much of that over the years. We have. The email and the texting and those kinds of things have taken over from meetings and phone calls, just picking up the phone. That was one of the biggest lessons I had to teach media people who worked for me was pick up the phone and call when you have a question, when you have a problem. Don't put it in an email. And there are always problems. There are always things that come up. And it's so much easier when you can have a conversation and have back and forth conversations rather than this is what happened, fix it. People like dealing with people they know. I think they do. And that's true in any any business, but I think particularly it is. in a media business where it is so personal. Mm -hmm. I agree. Now, Nebraska Furniture Mart gave you a lot of opportunities working with the Mart, but you've also capitalized on some of those opportunities. You've uh, received a number of awards, recognitions over the years, yet you don't talk about them. Well, I think that doing public service and giving back is the, I don't remember who said this, but it's the rent we pay for living on this earth. Well, you pay a lot of rent. I think we owe it. You are also very much involved in the Business Ethics Alliance here in Omaha, which mm -hmm. is primarily based over at Creighton University. But you're, you're kind of instrumental in making that successful. I've been a trustee for the Business Ethics Alliance for 12 years. The Business Ethics Alliance is a joint effort of Creighton Hyder School of Business the Omaha Chamber of Commerce, the Better Business Bureau, and then the Omaha Business Community. And so I was recruited as one of the first women to be one of the trustees because the executive director would look at these board meetings and see a sea of black suits. So we tried to make sure we wore red dresses when we went to those meetings so we would kind of stand out. Uh, but I've really spent a lot of time and effort over those 12 years encouraging general managers and general sales managers at broadcast stations to become members. That's been my personal goal is to recruit them. Have you been successful? Yes, I just wish sometimes they would stay longer. <laughs> <laughs> Ethics in this day and age is a, is, a, is a dangerous thing to bring up because how do you define it? It shouldn't be. But you, the definition changes, doesn't it? The definition is what's right. That's simple. That's that sample. You've been a groundbreaking uh, representative of women, particularly AWRT. Yes. Why is that important to you? I, uh, it just goes back to the days when I was first selling, or excuse me, working at KMTV. Women were just not allowed to participate in sales or um, take those kinds of jobs. I, I don't even know what year it would have been. There was a first sales manager who was a female in Omaha. Maybe you would know that. Oh. It's hard to remember. It's hard to because remember. Because it is a long time ago. But you just need to learn how to make inroads and stand up for our positions and so forth. So yeah, I was very involved in AWRT. I was their president for a long time. Uh, I was involved in another group called Women in Media and Marketing after AWRT left the market. Uh, I volunteer a lot for things like the WCA, which used to be the YWCA. And we're named Person of the Year back in 2003 by well, was, what was then the YWCA? I was one of their eight, I think, Women of Vision that year. Right. Which was a great One accolade. of many awards that you've been awarded. 
because of those relationships those are that relationships. you have built over That's the right. years. Yeah. It does make a big, big difference. Um, <clears throat> I do want to talk about Black, uh, Redstone. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking of the hotel for some reason. Because <laughs> it's right down the street from yeah. us, too. Uh, Redstone has been a major part of your life and has yes. provided you with a lot of opportunities. Well, that it has. How'd that come about? Um, I was let go at Fredrickson Hohenschel for reasons I won't get into, but I got, that's my famous forest fire story. But after a few months, the account went up for review and I was hired by Culver Marketing Group to help with a pitch for Nebraska Furniture Mart and got it back. So my 35 years has about a six month gap in it. When they were still with Fredrickson when before were, you moved to before Culver? Before we moved to Culver and took the agency over, or took the account over. So um, that was a very pivotal, pivotal year in my history was to be able to get that account back under my wings. They were happy to have you back. You were happy to have them back. Yes, yes, and yes, I hope so. Because again, we've been together now for 35 years. Well, how did Redstone become a player? Uh, Bob Culver was the owner of Culver Marketing Group. And when he left the agency, we operated under the name Culver for another year or so before we realized that there aren't any Culvers here at Culver Marketing Group. So. We had a little contest in the building to rename the agency. Where'd Redstone come from? The building was made out of Redstone. Just that simple. Just that simple. <laughs> <laughs> who were the players? <laughs> uh, Phil Webb was our chairman. And he was the one who implemented everything, the overall chairman. Our creative director was Steve Armbruster. Uh, Gail Seaton was our uh, chief marketing officer. Stacy Vance, our controller. And Jim Svoboda, who is the current president, was our direct marketing person. And was Nebraska Furniture Mart the biggest account at the agency? Yes, it was. But you'd also recruited some other accounts over the years as well. True. Can't live on one of them. Give me some ideas. I worked with Taco John's for over 25 years. When Taco John's first started, we would meet at the, the car co-op meetings. We're in the back of a bar. I don't even remember which bar it was, like on 72nd and L Street or something. And there were seven stores. And then I helped put together a co-op for the Omaha and Lincoln Market stores. And I think when I left them, there were 37 stores in the chain. So they're done very well. You've also built campaigns successfully for some others. I've done a lot of political advertising, which I like. I like working with political advertising for a couple of reasons. Number one is because it's something I can do to affect change. It's something where you can see what's going on. You can see what's happening. And get the right people in the right places. Uh, I always commented that, camp, that my uh, candidates, though, all became exponentially crazier the closer you got to an election day, which could get pretty stressful sometimes. But it was OK, because I knew when it was going to be over. When they closed the logs on that Friday before Tuesday election day, I was done. Everything was written, everything was ordered, everything, everything was paid was done. for. Yes. Uh -huh. It's a good way to leave it. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Tell me about. Looking back, now that you're semi-retired, I mean, you're still pretty active, but looking back, what do you hope your legacy is going to be in the Omaha advertising market? That I treated people fairly, that I treated people honestly, that we made change, that we learned a lot, that we sold a lot of microwaves and rugs and tacos and <laughs> Cox mediums and just made the community a better place. You bring up Cox Media, which when you started with them was just a cable company. They didn't have Correct. all the rest of this. You had to work to build the rest of that business. I helped them build the different product lines. So that was always interesting because Cox ended up being like six or seven different clients over the years instead of just one. Uh, we started out with Cox selling video product. And then it was a big deal when we added telephone. Woo, landline telephones. In competition with the big dog. In competition with the big dog. Western Bell. Yes. Although I think they might have been something else. Quest? Like Probably Quest. Okay. They had many names over the years, yes. too. And then we added high-speed internet, which was another big product. And then, the, then we had this little stab at trying to do uh, cell phones, but Cox didn't stay in that market more than a couple of years. In and out. Awfully competitive. Awfully competitive. And then it got to be home security. So again, one product phased in after another. So it was fun to watch them grow and take advantage of marketplace situations as the evolution of the consumer changed. 
You have been a mentor over the years to so many people in this market that have come up and become successful. Mostly women owe you a debt of gratitude because at the time, as you mentioned, there were no women salespeople in the media. And today, no. women outnumber men a lot. Or uh, some places else, almost exclusively women. And of course, once they're in the sales side, then they become sales managers, then general managers. Let's hope so. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. we're seeing that already. There are Correct. numerous general managers in both radio and television in the Omaha market. Mm -hmm. I'd like to feel maybe you had something to do with some of that. I hope so. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Now, when you look at how things have evolved, the consolidation, the multiple stations under one roof, uh, the consolidation of staff. What do you think of the business that is today? It's a lot harder. It's a lot less personal. It used to be that a sales department had a sales research team maybe, or maybe they had a promotions person, or maybe they had a sales secretary, Janelle, who you, you know well. And those things are just been written out with budget constraints over the years. Um, we used to be that if a radio station had two stations, you had two different sales staffs. Now they have seven radio stations and it's one sales staff. So lots more to do with a lot less. There's not as much conversation. There's not as much phone call. There's not as many meetings, although I think, think sometimes there's too many meetings, but I think that sometimes there should be more. Um, I think it's become a world of text and email and demand that I send you a request for a proposal at 4 o'clock on Thursday and I want it by 10 a.m. on Friday. And uh, that just breaks my heart. That's pretty common. It's pretty common. Don't like it. What about the agency landscape? There's been a lot of changes over the years. Some have come, some have gone, some remain. Mm -hmm. A lot of boutique agencies in town now from people who used to just be a sales rep either at a radio station or a media uh -huh. buyer at, a, at an agency. It's just a harder business. Plus, the digital world has changed a lot, too. It used to be that a radio salesperson sold radio. Now a radio salesperson sells radio and concerts and promotions and digital and email and SEO and everything else. It's a little hard to keep it straight. Oh, my gosh. I don't know how they do keep it straight. Some don't. <laughs> True. Well, from your perspective, you've seen it all, you've done it all. Where are we headed? Where are we going? Give me your crystal ball oh eye boy. view <laughs> of where this Omaha, particularly Omaha media landscape is headed. I see it being becoming more digital and less mainstream. I think that the Omaha World Herald's got some changing to do. I think that radio stations need to maybe sell integrated products a little bit better and have, again, more conversations with their clients about goals and what they really need rather than the packages. When you talk about integrated, what are you referring to? That not everybody needs a promotion, not everybody needs to be in digital, not everybody even needs radio, but they might need a combination of those products and the salespeople don't have sometimes the opportunity to glean the knowledge from the client to learn what those goals really are. Is some of that the fact that a lot of radio or television salespeople aren't around long enough to really develop that way? That's possibly true. It would be great to have a training mechanism in place at some of these stations, and I think that's lacking. Even How, do you go about it? How do you go about implementing that? Who's the, who would train? Who would train? That's a good question. It should be a sales manager, but sometimes they're not given enough time to, to learn to, to hone their craft. When you have to make that quota at the end of the week. When you have to make that quota at the end of the week. or It's, it's a business of what did you do for me today? Don't care what you did for me yesterday. Wasn't always that way. Wasn't always that way. Are we better off today than we were back then? I'm going to ask you that. You're going to have to ask the bean counters if it was working or not, but from a prospect of is it a good relationship business the way it used to be I think the answer is no you spend a lot of time each year at the Nebraska Broadcasters Association convention I know you enjoy the convention I go to it every year why because I get to see people that I don't get to see the rest of the year uh, again for my days doing a lot of statewide political I would work with radio stations in Ord and Nebraska City and 
Scott's Bluff and those places. And those people don't get to Omaha very often, but once a year I could go see them and have conversations and meet with them and say, hi, remember me, I'm Claudia. I handled the blah, blah, blah campaign. I'm the one who tried to get the checks mailed to you on time every week on time. And, and those last minute schedules on the log. Those last minute schedules on the log, yes. So you have relationships that you have built over the but years. But it makes a difference. If you know somebody, you're much more likely to help them than not help them. People like dealing with people they know. People like people dealing with they know, and people like eye contact. It's important still. It's important still. Even with email and texting, Isn't it it's sad? still important. I think it is. Where's the next generation coming from in terms of media? Coming from meaning? I mean, I mean what kind doesn't of seem like uh, we're, we're bringing along the next generation into our business. The next generation is much more likely to sell the media that they know. So they're going to be selling a lot more digital, a lot less mainstream media. It's been a great ride, though, hasn't it? It has. That it has. No regrets? No regrets. No, uh-uh. Would do it the same way again? Oh, there might be a few things I'd change along the way, but I'd have to stop and think about what they were, so they can't be too important, can they? <laughs> no. no. Well, thanks so much for reflecting on <laughs> an astounding career. Thank you. I've had a lot of fun, too. We had a lot of great friends. Our thanks to Claudia Martin for her perspectives, her history, in and around Nebraska Broadcasting. Our thanks also to Jeff Saban and the team here at WOWT Channel 6. For the Nebraska Broadcasters Association, Jim Tim, and our uh, Chairman Emeritus, Marty Riemenschneider. For the NBA, I'm Neil Nelkin.